The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to show number 25. Yes, this is show number 25. We've straightened out our numbering deficiencies here. And we are recording on January 8th, 2012. It's a Sunday. We're back to our normal day as well. So I want to welcome Fred Boaz and Holly Hurley. And joining us a little later on will be Larry Marks for his Holly and the Lobster Tail segment. So I guess we will get things started here. And welcome, everybody. Well, hello. Thank you. Thank so, you, uh, much. so you guys, you guys know I am totally obsessed with the royal family. I think we're all pretty clear about that at this point. Um, and I found our first bit of news. I think pretty much our first four stories all involved dead bodies at one point or another. Sorry, guys. Um, so, if you're into dead bodies, this is your podcast this week. Um, apparently, there was a body found on Queen Elizabeth's estate. Um, you know, they uh, I think they call it what is it Sandringham, the the vacation. Uh, house for the royal family. They found a body of a 17-year-old girl, um, and I believe this was on Sunday. Apparently, according to the article that's out here, the uh, the 17-year was found in Sandringham. She was a girl from Latvia, which is part of the old Soviet Republic, and she had been reported missing in August from her home in the town of Wisbech in the in eastern England, about 20 miles from Sandringham. The girl's remains were discovered New Year's Day by someone walking a dog in a wooded part of Sandringham, the country estate where Queen Elizabeth II and the royal family traditionally spend the Christmas holidays. Part of the vast estate is owned by the public. The body was found about three miles from the royal residence. See, that is, you know, the, the interesting thing to me about the story is the BBC reported that uh, this area is really popular for uh, pheasant and partridge shooting, um, which, you know, typically sometimes the royal household will attend. And it just, I mean, if this were like an episode of some, you know, crime show or if this were a novel, this would be totally suspicious and definitely totally related back to the royal family. In practice, I guess there's no proof yet as to whether or not that's the case. But that's super interesting to me. Well, police are saying that remains had lain there for some time and even called the uh, entomologist to examine insects at the site to help determine how long, which is right out of CSI, like you said. An initial attempt to build a DNA profile from the bone and muscle fri uh, fragments failed, and, but a test on, f on the femur details from one of the palms allowed detectives to make a uh, identifying the girl as Alyssa, but I guess that's her name, Alyssa Dimitri, I have... Uh, and uh, the death <laughs> is being treated as suspicious, and as we get more, we will let people know about that. That is, that is And uh, this, our second story is about the um, Mount Rainier, the uh, federal park, reopens after a fatal ranger shooting. Apparently, in, uh, rangers and volunteers uh, solemnly embraced as the Mount Rainier National Park reported to public, uh, reopened to the public on Saturday for the first time since Iraq War veterans shot and killed park ranger there on New Year's Day. Oh, you know, the sad thing about this story to me, Fred, you know, is that the uh, the ranger who was shot, you know, her name was Margaret Anderson, and she had worked there for the last three years with her husband, and she was, uh, the guy who shot her, you know, he was, a, he was a vet, he was, you know, as you said, coming back, and he was 24 years old, and they said he already had, like, mental problems, and, you know, the all the rangers are saying, you know, Mount Rainier is supposed to be such a happy place, such a family place, and that, you know, this sort of thing just mars that, and the terrible thing about it is, you know, here's a kid who's not mentally stable, and here are park rangers who are trying to, you know, just do this <laughs> thing for all the families coming to the park. I mean, just all the way around. I'm so glad that they're reopening, and I just hope that they can move past this. This is terrible. Well, there, there's a section that says that the, that the like you said, the park is a happy place. And a uh, park volunteer named Alan Evans, uh, who's from Graham, Washington, which is, I guess, the area where Mount Rainier is, said that after hugging that it said after hugging a ranger who was on duty, then when Anderson got when Anderson was killed, this is what the park is about. This is the first stop to trying to get everything as whole as can be. So reopening the park is a great thing. A candlelight vigil will be held tonight nearby Eaton for Anderson, who left behind her husband and two small children. A memorial service was scheduled for Tuesday in Tacoma. The park, which offers uh, miles of wooded trails, is spectacular vistas uh, from 
from, from which to see 14,410 foot Mount Rainier draws nearly 1.5 million and 2 million visitors for, per year. We wish the families, the park, and we wish everybody the best of luck and our condolences, of course, go out to the families. One of these Republican candidates on these seemingly endless um, debates, debate shows, uh, mm -hmm. these, are, these are turning into, this is turning into a reality series here. There was the one at 9 o'clock last night right. and then one at 9 o'clock this morning. Um, I, I want to say it was Rick Perry, since he was an Air Force pilot. Um, he said that um, something really needs to be done in support of these uh, veterans, for lack of a better word, coming back uh, from these various places. We have wars going on around the world. Uh, you know, using this as an example, um, they come back and something like this happens, you know, because it's like the old... Um, post-traumatic stress syndrome type thing uh, and I believe it was Rick Perry who says you know we the government's got to do something for these vets coming back well like I said as, as a veteran I'll tell people the Veterans Administration is not is not the friend of any veteran that I've ever known they are a, a a bureaucracy that is beyond belief and you know they they, they do very little in for many many cases in taking care of veterans but you know it seems that as the wars have gotten more technological since World War II, when my father served, that more and more veterans are coming back with PTSD and are being diagnosed with these uh, with the illnesses. Because you didn't see this as much or as or as much reported with uh, with, with World War II veterans. To a, you saw a little bit more with Vietnam era veterans, with Korea, and as the wars have gotten more modern, with more modern warfare, it seems that the stress goes along with it. So maybe it's a good idea we should try some old fashioned peace for a while. I, I am obviously always a fan of peace, and I say you know raw to that. But you know, my my father is a veteran. He's a wounded veteran. Um, all, he is on. Uh, he is uh, you know handicapped uh, from Vietnam actually. And I do think there's something to be said, Fred, as well as for the for the change in technology and also the change in sort of the polarization of war. Um, I think I think patriotism is much different in some ways. There's a less clear enemy in this day of sort of guerrilla warfare than there was in say World War II, where you had a big your your big administration fighting a big administration. Administration. But I uh, but I do think that a lot of that has to do with how far psychologists have come in diagnosing things. I mean, you know, PTSD, you know, no, it wasn't cool to be considered mentally incapable, you know, in the days that our, like my grandfather served in the war, you know, but by the time that my dad came back, it was already gaining popularity into saying like, hey, there are mental ramifications from being in a situation like this. And I, I think maybe it shows how far psychology has come as well. Oh, I, I I agree with you 100%. Cause I'm a I'm a world I'm a Vietnam era veteran, and luckily I never had the opportunity. I consider lucky to go overseas, although I would have if I'd been called. But the idea is that that you know these people we we get the the, the tech, we've gotten some modern medical techniques out of this that we wouldn't have had normally. Uh, very good surgery techniques have come out of these wars. But at the same time, like you said, that they're able to die as, as we get further into it, they're diagnosing syndromes that, like I said, as the technology gets through, we're finding that the technology is breeding the psychology, the psychology is breeding the cure, hopefully breeding the cure. I would hope so. And speaking of uh, speaking of rights that one would want to go abroad to defend, uh, you know, a, a teen mom actually shot and killed an intruder with a 911 dispatcher on the phone. I mean, you know, when you, you think about someone breaking into your house and you call 911, you hope two things. One, that they get there before anything happens. And two, that nothing's going to happen to you or you'll be able to keep something from happening to you. This girl was armed. It says in the conversation, she said to the dispatcher, I've got two guns in my hand. Is it okay to shoot him if he comes in the door? And the dispatcher said, I can't tell you to do that, but you do what you have to do to protect your baby. She was there with her three-month-old son when these two guys tried to break into her house. And what's more, they're charging the guy who was shot accomplice with uh, with first degree. Is it first degree murder or second degree murder? Because. Sorry, sorry. Uh, First degree because he yeah, because he left the guy there basically because he orchestrated this somebody got killed and then uh, and then he just left. And what does everybody think about this, Fred? I know in Pennsylvania now. Oh, let me um, tell you, you can't protect your like own property. This, the one thing I like about the story is that the authorities do not plan on charging the girl with this because she uh, even though she fatally shot the New Year's Eve intruder at her home, she was doing it in defense of her life. And like Ed said, I live in Pennsylvania, which is a 
almost very liberal in the gun laws as far. It's very, it's not easy to buy a gun, but it's not as difficult as it is in a lot of states. And I believe in protecting private property. If my wife's home alone, somebody in, an intruder comes in, by all means, shoot them. I mean, it's, it's, you, if you're, I'm not saying, I don't advocate people killing other people, don't get me wrong. But if it comes down to my life or theirs, they lose. Now, I'm trained in using a weapon, my wife is not. And, People should, if you're going to carry a weapon, if you're going to own a weapon, you should be required to go to classes to learn how to use them because it can be dangerous if you don't. But I am a firm believer in having, in, in having a weapon in my house. I'm a firm believer in using it if it needs to be done because I'm going to protect my family. I'm going to protect my wife, my, st- my son. I'm going to protect the people that are in my home, my house and property. These people broke the law to break into that girl's house. They put her, her, herself, they put her three-month-old child, they put those two people's lives in jeopardy. And the 911 dispatcher gave her the right advice. I can't tell you what to do, but do what you have to. And the fact that they're charging the other guy with, with, with uh, the death of his buddy is absolutely perfect because you, if you go in and you commit murder, if, 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 someone, if you're the wheel man, and I know a guy this happened to in California, Ed, you met him. This guy with the wheel man in a robbery that went bad, in which a, in which a person was killed, and he was went to jail from he went to jail for first degree murder and only was given a pardon because he did re- rehabilitate himself. So I have no problem with the charges. This story, I like what Oklahoma is doing, and I hope the girl gets some, some counseling and you know whatever. I I come from East Texas, as you know, Fred. Originally, before all my you know north northeastern and midwestern adventures, and I have very both of my parents actually, Fred, were trained to use firearms. My father always jokes, you know, he was the Vietnam veteran, but he always jokes that my mother is the sure shooter. My mother is the <laughs> one who's who's the good shot, you know. I mean, she's got a concealed handgun license. Most of my friends in Texas do, and there, it, it, there's actually a law that says if you trespass on someone's property, they have they are well within their rights to shoot you dead. And Same law. Pennsylvania. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, I got to say, I'm with you. I think Oklahoma's doing the right thing. I'm glad that that girl had the right to shoot that person. People shouldn't be breaking into your house with a knife in their hand. That's ridiculous. The problem that I have is when you have states, and I'll mention this, states like New Jersey, where it's almost impossible to get a handgun. I mean, in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, Texas, where you grew up, and I think Oklahoma, I'm not sure about Oklahoma, I have to check, are what are, what are called shall issue states. We're talking about concealed weapons. In Pennsylvania, as long as you have not been convicted of a felony, the sheriff's department shall issue yeah, a concealed shall weapons issue. permit. Yeah. And that concealed weapons permit is good anywhere except the cap- state capital of Harrisburg and, and Philadelphia. Philadelphia. But you can ca- but you know, concealed means concealed, and you have the right to carry concealed. And I can, and that concealed weapons permit in Pennsylvania is good in in 14 other states, one of them being Texas. So I could visit your parents in Texas and carry my concealed weapon in Texas with my Pennsylvania permit. And, and for, I like that. And for any weapon as of the second permit, the first permit you could only register one one weapon. Uh, Per permit, I mean, you could change it. You have to go in and change your permit if you want to change weapons. Right. But your first permit, which is a four or five year period, this is Pennsylvania we're speaking of, um, you have one weapon listed on that concealed weapon permit. When you renew it and you get your your permit for the second four years or five years, whatever the term is, it's um, all weapons, any and any weapon carried, I believe it says on the permit. Yeah, so then you could just swap weapons out whenever. Because the first one's to. being done almost as a almost as a probationary period for the first yep. four years. Once you have it done, they, they and they renew it almost instantly, and you uh, it's twenty five dollars in Pennsylvania for it. And something that you know, I mean, I don't have a problem with them requiring people to have training, but I I I, li- I think all fifty states should go with that because there's a town in Georgia, and I don't remember the name of the town where I read that. The crime rate zero. Every homeowner is required to ha- to own and know how to use a gun. Whoa. So. That's, you know, I think, I think it's interesting that you're talking about training. However, our very last dead body story, I promise everybody, um, has to do with, well, you know what, that's not particularly true. <laughs> but, you know, uh, talks about someone who knew very well how to use a handgun and accidentally shot themselves anyway. A uh, Navy SEAL in San Diego was showing off for a date in his house, uh, put his gun to his head believing that he hadn't loaded it. He thought it, it was empty. Yeah. Pulled the trigger and shot himself in the head. And you know, that, that brings me back to a, to a story. There, there have been a lot of tragedies like that. And this guy, any, 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 any gun owner that doesn't know whether his weapon is loaded or unloaded is an idiot. Because I was taught, and Ed, you were taught the same thing. I know the training you received. I pick up a weapon. I assume it's loaded. 
even if I know it's not. And you and I have handed weapons back and forth in California, and you hand that weapon out as if it, I've handed you empty weapons with the, with the cylinder open. You I'll, know tell a, I'll tell a funny a little anecdotal story here. Fred and myself have a longtime friend. Obviously, no names are going to be used, and especially because of the story. But we have a longtime friend that we've known 30-plus years. Um, we were visiting a relative of his. I'll change his story around a little bit to protect the innocent. Yes, we, were visiting, we were visiting a relative of his, and this relative had a handgun collection. So he took out this one particular model to show us all, and he hands it to Fred and hands it to myself, whatever, and we're all looking at it. And one of us hands it to our mutual friend, who it was a, happened to be a revolver, slams the, um, the cylinder closed, and starts pointing at everybody in the room. You know, now there's yeah, there's the example of okay, we all knew we everybody knew this thing was empty, but you don't play games like that. You don't close the cylinder in the case of a revolver and then just start, start pointing it at people. And he didn't have the weapon in his hand for very long. And needless yeah, needless to say, uh, he kind of got jumped, and that was the end of him holding onto that weapon. I mean, I've handed you my own my own personal weapon. Every time I handed you my personal weapon, it was a cylinder open, handed upside down, pointing with the barrel pointing away. You, know, it, it, you just do that. So yeah, so your point, Fred, was that this this guy, uh, you know, pointing it at his head and pulling the trigger. A reasonable person wouldn't even do that, so that's well, crazy. About 15... All I got out of these first four stories is that you guys know some crazy mother truckers. Oh, yeah. Well, you got to understand, about 15 years ago, and maybe maybe longer than that, there was a, uh, a television star who starred on a show called Voyagers, a guy named John Eric Hexham. He who killed had, himself, didn't uh, he? Who, who had been playing, who had uh, picked for a part for his next show that he was going to do, and was playing around with a blank pistol. Now, people don't understand that blanks do fire around. They fire a small cap. He put it up against his head, pulled the trigger, the cap came off and went into his temple, piece of bone went into his brain and killed him. Right. So, you got to understand that, the, that people have to understand the, the handguns are not to be played with. They're tools in the trade. They're not toys. And, well, again, our sympathy to the SEALs family, but what he did was just plain stupid. Especially for a SEAL with all of their training. This isn't some raw recruit that just went to uh, in, into the Army. You know, this is a SEAL who certainly should have known better. If Again, you know, if we've known better, and I just told a little anecdotal story, so obviously we do know better. If we know better, how could a SEAL not know better with their training? And he, uh, again, you got to assume it's loaded. And... You know, and that's the point. Well, if he thought it was unloaded, don't think. Holly? Don't think. Hey, I, just, I was just going to say amen and just, you know, I mean, that's that's the key. That's the key element there, Ed, as you said. Like, I, th I think we I think we covered it. I was just I was just agreeing. I just said amen. All yes. right. Well, who, yeah. who's next? Well, the, the next bit here, basically, we have a lot of tech news. And I guess we should probably start with the Consumer Electric Show. I mean, unanimously, it seems like the uh, the tech-related media is just slamming this year's show. Yeah, it just basically said there was nothing good that came out of this and that everything was standard quo. But here's what I got out of this, and I, I want to hear all of your thoughts on this, actually, Ed, because I know you follow tech news really closely. You know, um, they, they say that every year for years, the strategy that Apple has taken is that they never present, but they go to look at what other people are doing. Yeah, Apple never uh, really did much with CES because up until a couple of years ago, their big show was Macworld. And Macworld um, was where they would release new products and everything. They pulled out of Macworld a couple of years ago. Uh, I believe the Mac. The last Macworld in Boston was their last Macworld. Uh, but anyway, CES was never really for Mac. It's never really even, again, remember, it's, I just used the term CES. It's uh, called CES, but it stands for a Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, keyword consumer or keywords consumer electronics, not necessarily hardcore tech stuff, you know, where your Microsofts or your apples and so on and so forth they're specifically well but now specifically microsoft gave the keynote speech yep well decades. because microsoft is actually it's anticipated i i still as of even today haven't heard the definite word on it but microsoft is supposedly releasing a new game console or announcing a new game console at ces um yeah i i don't i 
as much as I'm into tech, I don't follow the game consoles because I'm not a gamer. Uh, but I guess that 360 or whatever it is, uh, X, the Xbox, I guess this is the next generation of that. Um, so supposedly... That's about it. At this year's CES, outside of maybe some uh, GE or Whirlpool refrigerators that are coming out, because remember, again, CES does cover appliances like that as well. On the regular tech type things coming out, I guess this new game console might be about the only thing. Uh, so, yeah, just from what I've seen, I agree with you, Ali, uh, these tech people. Uh, CES is a bomb this year. Well, and, you know, I mean, I, I actually found the most interesting thing about this story, you know, is Apple's uh, Apple's willingness to send someone but not to go. You know how I feel very polarized about Apple. I love them as much as I hate them. I'm, I'm on that, like, line of, like, being totally obsessed with them and really loving their products but also totally feeling like their business practices sometimes are just so – they're almost on the verge sometimes like being patent trolls and I know we're going to get like t tons of like hate mail about that but good bring it on we could use some emails um, you know I, I feel like my my issue they've gotten in trouble before because they tried to file a patent for something that Android had presented at a CES uh, in years previously that the Apple people had obviously well that's, that's still not over that's still not about. over um, oh yeah it, it okay. started with Steve Jobs Steve Jobs made the comment that uh He's going to bury Android and Google, that he says it's a stolen product and he's going to bury them. And Apple's continuing along with that even after the Jobs era. Which is just, well, I mean, all of the know. evidence points to, at this point, that he just, he just, you know, basically wished he'd come up with it. For, you know, they had already released it, put it into production before Apple even, mm -hmm. you know. Had, had had said boo about it and I just I don't know sometimes I get so angry because I'm like you know Apple you have so much to stand on there's no reason for him to start a battle with Flash there's no reason for him you know like all these vendettas that Steve Jobs got into especially later in his career you're like it's just not necessary you're powerful enough you don't have to play yeah, like yeah but in a lot of ways I think they want to save face because they uh, you know I mean, even though Steve Jobs no longer with us, he the, a lot of the a lot he created a lot of animosity in the industry. There are people who are after him. I mean, Apple's going to be around for a while. I just bought a new iPod and, for my kid. And it is what it is. Anybody I mean, a gamer? Shout they, they don't. Who here is it. a gamer? Who's going to buy this new Microsoft gaming console if there well, is one? Microsoft. Well, I'll, I'll probably wind up with the damn thing. Who are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, you're I'm not the one out there now. Yeah, you and I are in the same boat there, Fred. The, uh, the gamers in our household are not us. <laughs> I mean, I, not for nothing, but you know, that, that there's a, a new PS3 that came out recently with 160 gigs, and my son turned two of them in, plus some money from us to um, to get the three to get the new 360. So, you know, it is what it is, and you know, it, 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 it's they got the um, the Wii Fit, they've got the the little connects things to it. I mean, this stuff can go on the internet. It, it amazes the hell out of me, and the graphics on these games are like watching a real TV show. I mean, yeah. it's unbelievable. That it is. Uncanny Valley. I think it's creepy. I think it's in the Uncanny Valley, as they call it. You know, that's that's the uh, the tech nerd term for things that are so close to real that it's more creepy than it is good. And that's just what I think. Some I think some of these video games are so uncanny valley. It just makes me. I can't even watch them. I'm like, oh, that's too weird. What else did we have intact? Did you have anything else there? Well, we got about that, that, uh, scientists are talking about the fact this came out of Washington. They claim to have created the smallest wires ever developed in silicon. Just one atom tall and four atoms wide. What I'm trying to figure out is how in the hell am I get those things around my lights in my house? Well, I wonder. Yeah, I wonder how you're going to push anything through it, whether it's traditional electricity or if it's uh, optics. It's got to be science, uh, so science specific. Whether it's optics or, you know, true electricity, as I said, I, I wonder how you could push anything through something that small. Well, essentially, they say that they say that Ohm's law applies; that it holds. Yeah. It holds basically that it has to do with uh, resistance and voltage, and not right. to the actual that the electrical the current. Size. So it'll still still flow, right? Yeah, right. which, which I think is fascinating. Well, they say that experiments in atom by atom supercomputer models of the wires have been found that the wires maintain a compa low capacity for resistance, despite being more than twenty times thinner than conventional copper wires in microprocessors. So, you know, we're trying to get down smaller. I guess the age of Star Trek is hitting us because everything's going to be smaller. We'll be talking to our computers in a month. 
Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure all of that is basically already happening. I mean, you know, Siri is an indicator of that. What we're doing now is an indicator of that. The iPod was the beginning of that. I mean, you know, it's one of the things that my husband and I always talk about is the size of laptops, and you know, the ta the fact that tablets for most people are a toy, as you know, Ed and I have talked about, and you still keep your laptop. The size of a laptop is no longer what you need to hold the story. Hey, it's not a toy for us anymore. You know, especially you, Holly. CNN has their magic wall okay. that, you know, they always play with and you know, they have all their graphics and everything. Comes. Well, we're going to introduce today, uh, you, you people listening to the video podcast, uh, to our uh, audio podcast, Here this won't go. do any good for. Here we but, go. you, but you folks that are watching this on video or will watch our future video shows, we are premiering today our BaseNet video magic Tablet. <laughs> okay. Now we, we do have a very nice picture. I'll let my camera just adjust. There we oh, go. There's our BaseNet logo. We oh, so now we cool. have a a BaseNet Magic tablet. So on our video shows, <laughs> CNN, you might have your magic wall, but we have our magic tablet. Oh yeah. Oh god. I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, speaking of uh, technological advances that may or may not be useful at all, uh, Vizio uh, is thinking that they're going to really blow the PC market apart with their new super slick. Uh, sort well, they of could at the anticipated pricing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it worked for Apple. So the thing about anticipated pricing is the, the issue right now, um, to talk business speak for like five seconds, the issue right now in the in the uh, PC market is that it's a, what we like to call almost a perfectly competitive industry in that the products can't differentiate themselves for one another. They're all pretty much providing the same technology. Intel actually had a lot to do with that, but that's a story for another day um, in the same system. So the hardware people are being able, they're actually at a loss on. Most, uh, most hardware companies for computers actually operate at a loss in the PC market. And that's why Apple is considered right now by business people to be such an anomaly, is they found a way to differentiate themselves to get people to pay a lot more. Yeah, because they're a hardware company, not a software company. Right, but they but they found a way to get people to pay a lot more. I, so hardware companies I'm speaking of, that's actually why I say Intel right. has changed things, because Intel uh, still, still requires an enormous premium over what it costs them to make their chips. But the computers, the hardware that carries those chips, because all of them now, Intel has developed such a brand for themselves, all of them pretty much carry more or less the same processor. Uh, the hardware companies are not being able to demand the premium, except for Apple. Apple is a total like blockbuster anomaly. So what Vizio is trying to do, essentially, with their new, with their new models, uh, people are thinking, is basically try to break out of that. Yeah, low-end desktop or laptop computers. Um... Yeah, well, we'll just have to see. We'll have to see how the quality is. Uh, I know they're showing off these products at CES. Um, CES, by the way, is in Las Vegas. They, um, you know, it's a, it's a low-end product. It's kind of like what Gold Star used to be before they merged and became Lucky Gold Star and then just shortened it to LG. Uh, the original Gold Star was... That doesn't mean life's good? The uh, Yeah. The original Gold Star company was a very low-end, in some cases, legitimately a crappy product, um, but they evolved into something pretty good. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with this. this. This isn't a new brand. They've been out there for a while uh, selling different, various different models. And, you know, they've uh, carved out this niche as being a low-priced uh, product. So we'll see what these are like. Um, there have been pictures on the Internet of this all-in-one iMac-type desktop computer where the guts of the computer, as opposed to being in a tablet uh, in a tower, are in the monitor, just like an iMac, the current model of the iMac. So, you know, uh, probably lawsuits from Apple coming for that. Okay, uh, lawyers, clear your desks on this um, one. So, you know, we'll see where this goes. But I, as much of the as much as the next guy that uh, operates on a strict budget. If I was looking for a new desktop computer uh, and or monitor, hey, if this is the right price, if I could get a monitor and a computer all in one, uh, you know, iMac style uh, at a reasonable price, certainly, what's reasonable? Well, 
IMAX start at thirteen or fifteen hundred dollars, so anything under a thousand is reasonable. Um, I'm sure they're looking at the sub five hundred dollar market though, because a high end, pretty much a high end desktop computer now could be had for under five hundred bucks. So I'm sure this is looking at the sub five hundred market. So. Uh, could be interesting. What would make it even more interesting, and the specs on it that I read, is this is not a touchscreen monitor, though. Now, keep in mind, within the next six months, Windows 8 will be out, and it's going to be primarily for touchscreens, you know, with bigger icons and everything. I think current tablets and everything, but on a 27-inch screen or bigger. This could really be cool if this was a touchscreen monitor because then um, you put Windows 8 on it and I'll tell you if I could get a touchscreen all-in-one com desktop computer running Windows 8 with the touchscreen for under 500 bucks you know what oh, I there. might be one of the oh, first I'll one there. online for that oh, there. But you know what Ed I think I think they're gonna go for a higher price market with this model I think that I think they're trying to capture a new willingness to pay which is why they're saying like this is them kind of breaking out of the PC market but I also think you're on to something I don't know that Apple's gonna let this happen at all right and and along those lines I don't think Apple will allow that to happen either or I don't know how successful VZO could be with that because if you're talking a thousand dollar desktop computer, then you're going to be the you're going to buy the tried and perfected iMac for a few hundred dollars more at that point. Yeah, this will this will be interesting. I I actually agree something with to you, watch. But, you know, hey, Gosh, we the way to settle it out would be to sell it for about about seven hundred seven hundred and fifty dollars. Enough over the uh, the current market, so you're out on your own in a niche, but far enough under the Apple price that it makes sense to buy it. Mm-hmm. I, I do agree with Holly, though. I see a lot of lawsuits coming with this, and we'll just have to watch. Oh, without without a doubt. I'm this. sure it's already started. Well, and, uh, and something I'm watching today as far as, you know, breaking out of a business niche is concerned, uh, you know, Lululemon has been up. Uh, but for those of you uh, who are, you know, i got to say right before the show, Ed and Fred. Who live like, under rocks? Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> you guys were like, what the heck is Lululemon? <laughs> I have to say I had actually heard of it because you had done some um, uh, sports-related uh, shows for uh, BaseNet, even going back to your interview with the uh, that fellow from Brookline that wrote that author from Brookline. Uh, so I had heard you mention the name before, but... Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've been a fan for years. Um, Lululemon started as a really small athletic company out of Canada and has really grown, I mean, just by leaps and bounds. Just to give you an idea, uh, their trading is up 50% this year, um, which is amazing. Their shares are had gone up 50% this year, and Wall Street thinks they're going to get better. Now, they're down a little bit sort of towards the end of, of this past year, which I'm actually surprised about because I know this is something I get for Christmas every year. I would assume that would be a similar thing. Um, and as a result... What do you get for Christmas every year? Shares of Stock in Lululemon? No, unfortunately, just Lululemon gift certificates. I don't. I don't actually. According to my finance professor, it's never very smart to buy one individual stock. Now there are people who will disagree with me on that, but those people are looking for, you know, they're, they're, it's their job to follow the market. They're looking for arbitrage. Most of us layman investors, you're going to want to pick up tiny pieces of stock here and there in a portfolio. Just remember, he's a professor, not retired on stock information. Exactly. That's very, that's very, very true. But I think it sort of depends on the lifestyle you want to have. The lifestyle professor, as far as uh, money making versus effort goes, uh, usually comes out pretty far ahead of most. Uh, of oh, most, no, that's true. That's true. Especially for a master's program. But uh, but you know, Lu uh, Lululemon, uh, their founder is actually announcing that he's going to step away from his day to day role. Uh, his name's Chip Wilson, and uh, basically he said, Is he going to start selling Lulus or lemons? Hey. Uh, um, Eventually, he just says that he is really committed to the company's success, and he thinks that uh, he can leave them with the management team that's there now and let them, you know, run the day to day. And uh, I think that's really interesting, um, at, especially you know, we were talking about willingness to pay. You know, Nike's down. Nike's down this year, and they've been down for a lot of the year. Under Armour, however, is up, and so I think it really talks about how this willingness to pay that we're talking about with the Apples of the world, um, with the you know, with the Lululemons, you know, these companies that are small and differentiating themselves are uh, actually surviving and thriving in this market. I actually did a study on pet food recently that says something very similar. You know, where people are spending their money, they're spending more with these small 
with these small sort of luxury companies that have developed this quality uh, perception. Do you know how a do you know how a company like this uh, Boston-based company New Balance fits into the? Uh, I can no? I can look for you actually real quick. I'm not sure about how New Balance is doing lately. Are they um, into a real like high end athletic uh, stuff or is it? New, more Balance, of a... is a New Balance has thing. always been has always been uh seems seem to be the, uh, the the street shoe of the man. You know the the, the shoe of the common man because I mean they're not that overly priced. Right. Right. Also, uh, the thing about New Balance is it does have sort of its its little cult following, which speaks well for it. But they have always been an affordable brand. Uh, they they keep they have this one blockbuster shoe. Um, I can actually probably find it for you. Back when I was uh, you know writing more on my uh, on my sports blog. Uh, yeah, I know they got a blockbuster shoe we can't find. Sold one store in Pennsylvania. Oh well, that's I'm sorry about that. But the the shoe that, that's their big shoe actually is every store that carries them. When I was at City Sports, there's nobody who didn't carry uh, New Balance. And let me type in a number. No, 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 not Balance. The specific shoe itself is only carried by one one company in Pennsylvania. Uh, no, I know, but what I'm saying is, uh, it's their 1123. Uh, is the number on it? They do all their shoes by numbers because they don't want they don't want it to have like flashy names. They want it to be like you said, like this. There's this one shoe that you okay. like. Okay, they, they don't want to jump by Michael Jordan or something. Well, this exactly. one, this yeah. one had, does have a name, I believe. I'm not sure, but I don't know. Well, the the uh, most New Balance shoes actually go by numbers, and the one that's their really popular blockbuster shoe is the 1123. And people who run in the uh, is it the 1123? Yeah, and people who run in the 1123 have been running in in it usually for like 15 years. They're very loyal to it. They make very few changes to it. New Balance is kind of more of an old-time slogger. It's sort of more the Microsoft of running shoes and less the Apple. Okay. I would say the Apple right now is probably like a Vibram or uh, somebody who does a lot of barefoot running shoes. I can't, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I have problems with paying $300 for <laughs> a pair of running sneakers for a kid of 19 years old, which is what, uh, you know, they're, they're all out there popular. So, I mean, I, I'm glad New Balance and companies like that are in business because we can still pick up reasonable, decent decent shoes at a decent price well what about these people that uh, collect sneakers as hobbies i've had several of these kind of kids working for me over the years where they would buy every brand new model of sneaker that came out and then never took it out of the cardboard box never wore it once they would leave it in the cardboard box stick it in their closet but they could say they owned the Michael Jordan Air, for instance, or something. Well, I, I love that you that you brought this up, Ed, because you know I'm. Uh, I mean, Ed, that's when you, we, huh? Yeah. When I well, when I mentioned, I don't I don't leave them in the box. Actually, when we when we mentioned Lululemon, Ed joked that I was you know going to plug my website, which I will do. Uh, it's called WearItBright.com. I just put a post up about a new pair of Keen shoes that I have. I absolutely love them. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at at WearItBright, and I also talk about all of our base net stuff on there. So at WearItBright or WearItBright.com, as in I like to wear clothing that is bright. And but the big thing for me, Ed, is I don't think anything is any good if it's not functional. And when it comes to keeping tennis shoes in a box, that's not what they're made to do. No. You know, I, I really harangue at companies, tennis shoe companies that put all this technology into the way the shoe looks, but don't put equal uh, effort into the way the shoe, func the shoe functions. It's got to work, right? Exactly. I, you know, that's my whole thing is I love for things to look good. I think they should look good. I think you should invest some time in the way they fit because you, you know, it's important as a fit person that you feel like you look good while you're doing your thing. But more important is that you can do your thing. I think functionality is tough. I think keeping things in a box is ridiculous. That's just no, crazy. absolutely. If I buy sneakers or shoes, whether it's a name brand or a non-name brand, I don't care if I pay $10 for it or $100 for it. If my feet hurt after an hour, it didn't work for me. And I, so. I personally found a lot of your mid-range price shoes that, you know, I mean, I don't pay more than $20 for a pair of sneakers because I'm cheap. I mean, uh, I, I want to find Frugal. what's going on. But Frugal. I found, I, I go through sneakers and I tear them up and, I mean, paying thirty dollars or three hundred dollars for a pair of sneakers to me would be just be ridiculous because it it makes no sense to me. I'm just gonna tear the things up in the yard anyway. Yeah, I a lot a lot of what I talk about on my blog is you know if you're gonna charge three hundred dollars for a pair of sneakers, you better give me three hundred dollars worth of function out of those. Those things better last me like ten years. They better run like a dream. They better hold up. They better when I cover them in mud, I better not feel it on my sock. Like I mean, I expect for every dollar I spend on, I actually don't spend a lot on the shoes that I wear. And as Ed has mentioned, I have a pretty significant collection. 
I uh, I make sure that every dollar I spend on shoes comes back to me in functionality. If it doesn't, it's not worth the money. I'll tell you before be better clean themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Before we wrap this up and move on to something else to move things along here, I I wore Reebok sneakers for years, and I'll tell you, I've also then worn. Fred's $20 sneakers. The $20 sneakers, maybe I'll get three months out of them. I'll get a pair of even, say, the mid-range, like Fred also mentioned, say, a $60 pair of Reeboks that would last me two years. So, you know, I could get $60 Reeboks that'll last me two years, or I could be cheap and get the Walmart $20 sneakers, but they're shot in three months. But that's so. not what, I'm, what I'm talking about is buying a $300 sneaker somewhere. The kid's got them on his feet three months, outgrows them, and now he wants another pair of $300 sneakers. These no, that, that's either, different. I'm, I'm, I'm talking us. I'm talking an adult. Long, you know. And the company's going simply for the fact that it's a name brand, so they can charge the extra money. There's no functionality out of it. They don't last long. They're not made well. And... You know, that, that, that same $60 pair of Reeboks that you and I can get two years out of, I can wear them on, on business trips to Boston. I can wear them on business trips to New York like I did. I mean, the stores, that the, 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 show, the shoes that I wore for our, our, um, our holiday special, which, by the way, people can see it uh, at, our, at the BaseNet website at www.basenettv.com. I wore those. I've had those sneakers for almost two and a half years. I think we paid $30 for them in Walmart. So the idea is that those things can be done and, you know, they're comfortable. They get the job done. They were white. They're now kind of a dingy gray. You know, but it, it, they, I wear them every day. You know, I I I uh, I love this conversation. Obviously, it's right in my alley. But my uh, but I I do feel like when it comes to your twenty dollars, sixty dollars. I mean, my professional opinion as somebody who reviews clothing and as somebody who was a personal trainer and a marathoner is if I I don't find that I see value for my dollar over about a hundred dollars. You know, typically when shoes are first released, they might cost a little bit over a hundred, but you can get last season's shoe in that same make and model. Usually they change very little but from season to season, truth told. I mean there the are stores exceptions want, to that. stores want to get rid of them as fast as they can. Yeah, of course. And when you and then when you get them on sale, typically you can get the same technology for a little less than a hundred dollars. You yeah, it, you yeah. know, my professional opinion is again you should replace your shoes every six months or so. So yeah, I don't think spending more for that you typically see the return on investment you should. And yeah. that's my my two cents. But what do we have next? Sense, well this one's gonna inflame Larry. Actually I want Larry to tell us all about uh all about his story for this week that he brought us the uh the one about his girlfriend uh that he loves so much. Ms. Casey? Yes. Wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't bring up any story about that. Oh, yes, you did. Casey Anthony is putting up a video diary, and I do believe you, uh, you sent us that information this week. Well, whether or not it came from you, I certainly did get it eventually. And I watched Casey Anthony's whole video diary, and I want that, I want that four minutes of my life back. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, oh, you mean you mean you didn't get the memo from you didn't get the memo from Fred? She's going to be your replacement co our replacement co-host on as we see it. Yeah, that's what I heard. Did yeah. you hear? Did you hear on her uh, video diary? She said that she's going to get a Skype account now and everything, and she's going to start skyping. So we yeah, might as well bring her on as a co-host. You know, I got to just say, guys, you guys deserve better than that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, she, I, I, I do not know how to feel about this because unlike some people, I don't have really firm opinions on whether she did it or didn't do it. As a point of principle, I stayed out of the case the whole time. But boy, watching this thing, I was like, man, whoever released this, because you know she recorded this back in October and apparently right. someone else helped her put up this website and finally post it. Whoever thought that this was something the world had to see must have just had nothing better to do. Because I just, she told, she said nothing new. She gave it's us okay. It makes this podcast so good. I feel great about. We're a world class podcast compared to that. Indeed. When Holly was it really that bad. Oh you know, God! It was. It was nothing. That's there, it not was nothing. Yeah, there's no content. She didn't yeah, say anything. Like, uh, but you know what? She kept saying that seemed really important to her. And those of you who did watch the trial a little more closely than I did, I would love to hear what you think about this. She kept saying that the computer was hers. She had adopted a dog, and that it was hers, and that she really felt like these things belonged to her, and that she right. could take them with her. You know, and that these were her things. And this need for ownership, I found interesting considering well she's had something that was irrevocably hers at one point in her life and whether or not you think that she was responsible for it no longer existing 
I, I just found that very interesting. Yeah, now she's got her dog. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? No, go ahead and watch it. It's all over the place. I don't I don't even think it's getting an awful lot of views. I don't think it's getting an awful lot of traffic even from what I it's know. Not, I think it's getting more comment than it's actually getting views cuz when I when I as I said I watched the whole thing one of those 4 minutes of my life back, there were only like 126,000 views on the original post, which okay. is for someone with her level of exposure relatively small. There's one thing I want to say about um, you know, Casey Anthony and her pet Maybe they should take a DNA sample now so that if the dog mysteriously ends up dead, maybe they'll have a way to prove that she did it, and that she killed the dog. Dum -de -dum -dum. And it's, it's up to a half a million views now. <laughs> oh, there you go. Right. See, what, see what exposure on Basenet does? All right, so let's uh, go to another exciting of Holly and the Lobster Tales before we wrap things up. Larry? Okay, first one is the Philadelphia Mint. Okay, produces 26 million pennies a day. What a waste. Yeah, no, I know. Really, I thought they were doing a lot of pennies. <clears throat> I thought so, too. That's an awful lot of pennies. The only time I use pennies is when I go to Brugger's, and that's <laughs> about it. Why Brugger's? Because it comes to, because the breakfast I have, it comes to like $5.22, <laughs> and I can get rid of Two pennies every day when they go to Brugger's. Larry, Larry, use a debit card. Bank of America is not going to charge five dollars a month service charge. Use your debit card. I know. I thought we didn't like Bank of America. But you know, I, I love it. But see, that's what that's what people do. People try to get rid of pennies. Yeah. And here they are. And here they are producing this <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> amount. I know we're trying to have, have, have a, take a penny, leave a penny, and just don't even bother. How about how about we're trying to save the federal government millions of dollars? Let's stop making twenty six million pennies a day. A day, a day, a day, a no day, a day. Yep, twenty six million pennies a day. What's your second one? Okay. I'm sorry, Bob. Go ahead. I couldn't help myself. Thomas Edison. Okay, Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, was afraid of the dark. <laughs> kind of ironic. Yeah. Makes sense, though. Okay, yeah. and, and number three is. A quarter has 119 grooves on its edges. A dime has one less groove. A lot of grooves. Is there a significance to the number of grooves that are on either end? The grooves on the quarter and on the dime is because, <clears throat> you know, was added to the quarter and the dime because people would take a file and they would, you know, shave the sides of the coin and they would take the shavings in they would take the shavings that they got and they would sell the shavings. And so they added the ridges around the quarter and the dime so that it would let the person that, you know, had those, you know, quarters or dimes in their possession, that would let them know that the coin had been tampered with. Okay, because the penny and nickel obviously don't have the grooves around the edge. That's very interesting. Okay. okay, number four. What's your, what's your last one, Larry? Okay. Last one is there are 18 different animal shapes in the Animal Crackers Zoo. That I didn't know. How many animals are there in a regular zoo? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> a lot more than 18, I hope. <laughs> Could you name them, Larry? No. Phil, Chuck, <laughs> Steve... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I just these were the best today, Larry. I so <laughs> Those were good ones. Well, I hate to bring the mood down, but obviously we're going to wrap it up because uh, Ed and I have to go on to taping another podcast today. But uh, for our obituaries today, um, are we going to mention the name of the podcast you guys are going to do? Absolutely. This will be our first recording of the Crashing Glass podcast. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, it's going to be myself and Jill Henley Lawrence, who's also on the BaseNet Internet uh, Network. And we're going to be including my friend Laura Wilson, who is a professional personal trainer. She's the fitness manager up there by you, Ed, in Boston at the Commonwealth Sports Club. And we're going to be talking about New Year's resolutions and how to achieve them, what's, uh, you know, what's a good way to get there, and what's a really good way to keep them going once the momentum dies out from the first of the new year. So should be exciting. Please tune into that later this week, hopefully. 
Yep, we're expecting that to be released on Friday. And uh, while we are on the subject, Sunday, every Sunday will be uh, as we see it. Wednesdays, once we get into a regular schedule, it's a little crazy now with uh, this primary season going on, but Wednesdays will ultimately be uh, the day for Viewpoint and then the Crashing Glass on Fridays. So we're th going to be three days a week now with and new product. Viewpoint, and the Viewpoint is hosted by uh, political correspondent Tony Mazzucco. There you go. Okay, so what what did we have, Holly, to, in closing? Well, this year, uh, or today, actually, Fred asked me to uh, to do the obit because uh, it's a very special one. A uh, girl by the name of Jessica Joy Reese, who was 12 years old, lost her battle with cancer on Thursday. Um, she'd been battling for 10 months, and she was... Uh, she had her family actually announce it on her Facebook page. She was followed by tens of thousands of people. Uh, with her family, uh, she started the, um, sorry, she start. I'm, I'm getting a little teary. She started the NEGU found, uh, Foundation, N-E-G-U, for Never Ever Give Up. Um, and uh, it's a not-for-profit to raise awareness for pediatric cancer, and they provided what they called joy jars, which were stuffed with candy and toys uh, for sick children, and they sold more than 3,000 and distributed them to six children in uh, 27 states this year, and after her diagnosis, she started, she started uh, blogging about her experience, and her father, who was the pastor of a church um, in their area, she's, uh, she's from Orange County, uh, he's the pastor at the Saddleback Church was supporting her, and uh, I know she's going to be greatly missed by the world at large. I think she provided hope and love for a lot of people who needed it. And so, you know, I know I can say this because her father was a pastor, you know, God bless the Reese family, and uh, our prayers are that she's in a much better place now. How old was her she? Facebook, her Facebook page address is facebook.com forward slash Jesse, Jessica Joy Reese, R-E-E-S. Go over, check it out, and uh, blah, you know, post something for us because uh, we, we feel for her family. So, yeah, so that's a, a sad way to end today, but... Nonetheless, hopefully a hopeful one for survivors in the future. Hopefully her foundation will be helpful for others who are dealing with what she dealt with. Absolutely. That's the best thing about a successful foundation is that it continues on. And uh, 50 years from now, hopefully the foundation will still be around doing some good. Oh, so, yeah. you know, it's fine. Uh, all right. So with that, uh, I just want to remind everybody that they could send their comments suggestions about this show or any BaseNet show to info at basenetintermedia.com. Uh, visit our website at basenettv.com for all of our programming. On Facebook, you could follow us as BaseNet. On Google+, Plus, we are BaseNet Internet Television. And on Twitter, BaseNet TV. From Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. From Swiftwater, Pennsylvania, the Pocono Mountains, I'm Fred Boas. And from St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Holly Hurley. And from Brookline, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. We'll see you next time. Good night. Bye.